Welcome back to Vitamins on Catalyst University. My name is Kevin Tokoff. Make sure to like this video and subscribe to the channel for future videos and notifications. In this video, we're going to talk about vitamin K, vitamin K metabolism, and how it's used in the human body. All right, so vitamin K, again, just like in the case of vitamin A, is a general name for a class of compounds that all are functionally related. Um, the main vitamin K molecules we're going to talk about are phylloquinone and menaquinone, all right? the structures of which are shown up here and down at the bottom. This one at the top is referred to as phylloquinone, and the one at the bottom is known as menaquinone. All right, so vitamin K is, number one, not biosynthesized in, in humans and mammals. It's made in plants. Now, one thing, and you may not remember this, but if you go back earlier in the photosynthesis playlist, if you look at this uh, electron transport chain that occurs in the photosystems of the light-dependent reactions, you'll notice that one of the electron acceptors in photosystem 1 is phyloquinone. That's interesting. It turns out that that phyloquinone is the same phyloquinone that we actually can use as vitamin K. Now, if we go back and look at the uh, carotenoids, which was in the vitamin A video, the original sources of vitamin A, which are the carotenes mostly, are not active. We have to do a lot of processing in order to get use out of um, vitamin A's. Vitamin K's are active in this form. We can actually use this form of vitamin K to do the functions that we're going to talk about in a couple of slides. However, some cells may wish to process this phylloquinone up here into another form, menaquinone down here. So both of these forms are usable. And in general, the difference between menaquinones and phylloquinones um, are that phylloquinones are defined by having this tail right here. The menaquinones can have repeating isoprenoid units right here that have varying chain lengths. Okay. In any case, phylloquinone is what we call deprenylated. This group out here, this tail, is called a prenyl group or a polyprenyl group. It is deprenylated to form this compound, which is called menadione. This compound is an intermediate and has no vitamin K activity, but it will be polyprenylated by a polyprenyl transferase to form menaquinone. All right, and again, both phylloquinone and menaquinone have vitamin K activity. And just one thing I want to make you understand and hopefully have an appreciation for is phylloquinone or vitamin K1 has one completely different use in plants. They use it as an electron acceptor in their electron transport chain in photosystem 1. However, we're going to use it for something very, very different. Okay. Now there's one thing I want to show you. If you look at this part of the ring right here of the vitamin K's that has these two ketones on either side of the ring, okay, it's present in all of these, anytime you have a six-membered ring that has all four of these double bonds conjugated, and in other words, you have a carbonyl up here and a carbonyl down there, that's what we call a quinone ring. What do I mean by that? Look down here. This is a quinone ring right here. It turns out that vitamin K's are inactive in the quinone form. They have to be reduced into what are called the quinol forms. And the quinol differ in the sense that instead of ketones, they're hydroxyls, and the ring has been completely aromatized. Okay, All vitamin K's are only active in the quinol form. So we're going to need to reduce the quinones into their corresponding quinols. So this is where we're going to talk about vitamin K metabolism and we're going to refer to something called the vitamin K cycle. All right, parent compounds, vitamin K1. These would be what you would call your phylloquinones, or in some cases, menaquinones. We're going to consider both of them as being here. The quinones have to be reduced into their quinol forms. Okay, this is catalyzed by some sort of quinone reductase. All right, there's two different ones that can catalyze this reaction, but suffice it to say, the quinones have to be reduced into their corresponding quinol forms. And so if this were phylloquinone being reduced, the reduced form would be phylloquinol. If menaquinone was reduced, it would be menaquinol. Okay? You just change the suffix at the end of the name to all. In their quinol form, they are active vitamin K compounds. And it turns out there's an enzyme that's very important in blood clotting that's going to use the vitamin K in the quinol form as a cofactor. 
All right. Now, before I go into this reaction, seems like a side note, but it's very important here. In the blood, you have what are called coagulation factors or coagulation enzymes. These are enzymes that help blood to clot when you have a blood vessel injury. In particular, coagulation factors 2, 7, 9, and 10, and then some related proteins, S, C, and Z, it turns out that in their, in their synthesized state, they are completely inactive. It turns out that these proteins have what have in their uh, structure glutamic acid residues, the amino acid glutamic acid. Now, if you've ever seen the structure of glutamic acid, which we'll look at on the next slide, this is a glutamic acid, and notice its R group has one carboxyl group. It turns out that even having that, it are still inactive. These glutamic acid residues have to have another carboxyl group added to the same glutamic acid R group in order to become activated. In other words, glutamic acid has to be carboxylated. We're going to look at how that occurs in the next slide, but suffice it to say, there's an enzyme called carboxylase epoxidase. All right? This is an enzyme that's going to carboxylate these coagulation factors on specific glutamic acid residues. The enzyme carboxylase epoxidase uses the quinol vitamin K as a cofactor. Now, I really don't so much consider it a cofactor, although most people would call it that. It's really more of a substrate. Vitamin K is a substrate. The reason it's a substrate is because for a coenzyme or cofactor to be classified as that, it needs to be part of the enzyme in the sense that it's regenerated at the end of the catalytic cycle. Clearly, you can see that the quinol form of vitamin K is turned into an epoxide and must be recycled. It's not technically a coenzyme or a cofactor. It's a substrate. All right, but that's besides the point. When vitamin K quinols go through the cycle of carboxylase epoxidase, they are epoxidated to form what's called a vitamin K23 epoxide, in which case they are useless. They have to be recycled. In which case, an enzyme called vitamin K23 epoxide reductase reduces the epoxide back to the quinone form, the parent compound, and then the quinone has to be reduced into the quinol form. So you're going to have a series, ultimately, of three enzymes, reduce the quinone to a quinol, carboxylate the uh, glutamic acid residues on those clotting factors, and then reduce the epoxide back to the quinone. This series of three enzymes is called the vitamin K cycle. And its purpose overall is to regenerate vitamin K so that you can continue carboxylating these proteins. All right? Let's look at this reaction. Here's the glutamic acid residue on our coagulation factors. Through the action of this enzyme, carboxylase epoxidase, this position right here, as you can see here in red, gets carboxylated. So now glutamic acid now has two carboxyl groups, in which case it's no longer, no longer glutamic acid. Okay? So ultimately what's going to happen is, and we'll go into it more in other videos, but suffice it to say, having these two carboxyls with negative charges here makes this residue exceedingly good at binding calcium ions. And because calcium ions stick on the extracellular matrix uh, phospholipids, that allows these proteins, these coagulation factors, to stick to the calcium ions, which effectively, indirectly, sticks them to the blood vessel walls. That's how coagulation factors attach themselves. It turns out one carboxyl group, which is typical of glutamic acid, is not enough to bind calcium. And hopefully you can see here, here's the quinol form. It's very small, but you can see it of the vitamin K. And here it's been turned into the quinone epoxide. This is what happens in the reaction of carboxylase epoxidase. And remember that extra carboxyl group right here helps to chelate calcium ions so that the proteins can stick onto the phospholipids of the uh, extracellular matrix around those cells. Okay? And that's pretty much what we have for vitamin K. All right. Make sure to like this video and subscribe to the channel for future videos and notifications. In the next video, we're going to go over another vitamin. Thank you.